This video is not just going to be about how to do a voltage drop test using a multimeter. It's going to be so much more. It's also going to be why voltage drop can allow you to use a multimeter to measure for parasitic draws using the fuses in your junction box, but also how measuring voltage drop and understanding voltage drop has allowed manufacturers to use two and one wire sensors. Also why looking at electrical diagrams, sometimes you see a resistor inside your engine control module or your PCM, but also why when you measure for voltage at, by back probing a connector and you expect five volts, it's five volts connected or plugged in, but when you unplug it, it's 12 volts. Hey, 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 how's it going? Do it yourselfers. So as some of you asked in my previous video and by popular demand, today I'm gonna show you how to perform a voltage drop test on any electrical circuit on your car. But not just that, I'm also gonna explain to you how voltage drop and testing for voltage drop uh, explains all the other things we just talked about. But first, let's get on to what is voltage drop and how you can perform a voltage drop test. So basically, voltage drop is the loss of voltage when current flows through a resistance or a resistance or a load inside of a circuit. All right, so first let's start off with a very basic uh, circuit. Here's our car battery as our voltage supply. Let's say it's 12 volts, just to have an even number. And here's our resistance or load to the flow of current through this circuit, which is this test light with an incandescent light bulb. So if you were to measure for voltage drop and try to measure the voltage drop of this resistance in this circuit, you would put one test lead before the resistance or the load, and then the other test lead would go right after it. But since this is a test light and I can't put it right after the light bulb, I'm gonna put it right up here at this connector where it gets to our car battery. And as you can see, we have about 12.03 volts, which is basically what we have available on this battery, which is a little bit undercharged. Again, as you can see at 12.06, 12.07 volts. All right, so this was a very basic test to show you how voltage drop looks like when you have an accounted for or designed for single load in a circuit. Now, one thing is very important to know about voltage drop is that, let's say you had more than one load inside of the circuit. Let's say you had a test light and also this fuel level sensor in the same circuit. This is basically a float attached to this potentiometer. The resistance varies based on the location of this float, as you can see here. All right, so in this setup, we have two points of resistance to the flow of current or two loads on the same circuit. Now, if we were to measure for voltage drop uh, for our test light or this first load, we would get not get the same number. We would in fact get 7.7 .7 volts. So our voltage drop for this load is 7.6 volts. And again, if we were to measure for voltage drop across this load or this potentiometer in this case, again, one test lead before and one test lead after it, and we would get 4.3 volts. All right, so you might be asking, what's the point of this? Show us the test already and all the other things we talked about. Well, bear with me. If you understand this next point, understanding voltage drop, testing for voltage drop, and all the other things we talked about will become super duper, super, super duper easy. And that is that voltage drop across a point of resistance in a circuit is directly proportionate to the amount of resistance in that point as it relates to the total amount of resistance inside of the circuit. Now, if you were to write a formula for it, it would look like this. The resistance of test light divided by total resistance of the circuit would give you the percentage or the proportion of the resistance of the test light as it relates to the total amount of resistance inside the circuit, total or times by the total voltage, which would be the voltage of this car battery would give you the voltage drop across this load, which is this test light. Now, if you go back a little bit to where we only had the test light inside our circuit and we measured it for a voltage drop and that voltage drop equaled the volts or the voltage we had available at our source or this car battery, and we look at this formula, it makes perfect sense, right? Because the resistance of the test light divided by total resistance of the circuit, which in this circuit is gonna be pretty much the test light itself. Basically, you divide the resistance of the test light by itself, you get one, you times that by the total available voltage, which is again, 12 volts of this car battery, you get, uh, you get your voltage drop is gonna equal the volts you have available at your car battery. All right, so the point of adding this second load to this circuit was try to make you understand how when you have uh, more loads inside a circuit, how that relates to voltage drop across that first load or the design load on the circuit, and also how that has its own voltage drop. But you know, basically when you do voltage drop tests on your car, you're looking for uh, points of resistance that are unaccounted or undesigned for like, you know, corroded wires, corroded terminals, 
you know, weak wires, frayed wires, uh, etc. All those points will have their own resistance to the flow of current and you basically, you're going to be using the same method with the multimeter going around that circuit trying to find that point of resistance by its voltage drop. Alright, now for the sake of argument, let's say that you suspect a weak or bad alternator. You suspect that this alternator is not putting enough current to not just run the car, but also not enough to recharge the battery, which uh, we go usually here. Now, before you run to the parts store and buy a new alternator and try to replace it, one of the tests you need to do is to do a voltage drop test from the stud of the alternator all the way down to the positive post of your battery because this alternator could be fine, could be working correctly, putting enough voltage and amps, but that it's not that voltage or current is not making it to the positive post of your battery because the resistance or unaccounted for resistance in the way of corrosion, either at this nut where it connects this cable to this uh, stud or somewhere in the, in the wiring or the cable that goes from the stud to the positive post of your battery or this connector itself. All right, so you get your multimeter, put the dial at 20 volts, since we don't expect to measure anything more than 20 volts. And then not only you wanna turn on whatever circuit you're doing a voltage drop test, because that's the only way you can measure voltage drop, but also, if possible, you wanna put as much load on that circuit as you can. So on this circuit for our alternator, our alternator not only recharges our battery, but it also, as you can see, that cable that comes out of, the, out of there, out of the alternator, it comes around, one of it goes to our positive post of our battery, the other one actually goes to this junction box and from there it branches off and powers different components of the car. So its job is to not just recharge the battery but also run the electronics in the car while the engine is running. So now you want to load that circuit by turning on all the components that you can. You, know, you turn on your, uh, your blower fan, you know, your radio, defogger, headlights, whatever load you can think of, you put it on the circuit. And that's because of this equation that we talked about because the total resistance of the circuit, in this case, since that alternator is feeding all the different components, can be changed. So as you turn more components on, let's say you turn on the blower fan, you're actually reducing the resistance because the blower fan uses currents. You know, as you, when it's off, obviously no current is flowing. It has the maximum amount of resistance to the flow of current basically not allowing for the flow of current. As you reduce that resistance by turning it on, you reduce the total resistance of the circuit. Now the resistance of the corrosion, and let's say you suspect that corrosion at the terminal on the alternator is constant. Whatever that corrosion is, that resistance is constant. constant. So, as you re, so as you reduce the total resistance of the circuit, you're increasing the resistance of, you know, I gotta scratch this test light out, that corrosion on that stud on the alternator and then you times that by the total voltage or the car battery voltage available, you'll get a higher number. So when you're doing the voltage drop test across that stud where your spit corrosion is, that number is gonna be higher the lower the total resistance of the circuit is. And you get the total resistance of the circuit lower as you turn on and re or reduce the resistance by you know, turning on different components like the blower fan, the defrog, the headlights, etc. So in so many words, you want to put full load or maximum load on the circuit that you're looking for voltage drop. So when you find that unaccounted voltage drop, that accounts for more of a voltage drop and you see it better or you find it better using a multimeter. All right, so back to the actual test for this, let's say it alternator. Now this again has to be with the engine running, the full load being put on the alternator. Unfortunately, I cannot run this engine because it doesn't have coolant because it has a coolant leak. Stay tuned for fixing that in another video. But basically with the engine running, full load on the alternator, you get one test lead. First, you put it on the stud, you grab the other test lead, pretty much like we did with the test light. You put it at the other end, and then that gives you the total voltage drop from that post of the battery to the stud. If it's more than, you know, let's say 0 0.3, 0 0.4, definitely 0.5 volts, then you have excessive resistance from that post through this cable to the positive post of your battery. And then, and you can work your way back. So you try to find where exactly that resistance is. So you go, you know, you, again with one test lead on the stud, you can come back here, put it on that nut that's attaching that cable to the stud. And then if you get the, again, your voltage drop is the same, then you found your point of resistance. Also, it should be said that in this case, most common point of excessive resistance or excessive voltage drop is gonna be between this connector and the positive post of your battery. You get, you, know, you get build up here, and then that's gonna have its uh, own resistance causing you too much voltage drop. Now, of course, you wanna do a voltage drop test on both sides of the circuit, and that was the power side for this alternator. You, of course, wanna do a voltage drop test for the negative side as well. 
because this alternator, as is the case for most alternators, is grounded by the way of your engine. See, this alternator is obviously attached to the engine. The engine is grounded or attached to the chassis by the way of grounding cables. The chassis is grounded back to the negative post of your battery by its own grounding cable. So you put one test lead on the alternator casing itself, you put the other test lead on the negative post of your battery, you measure that voltage drop. If it's excessive, you work your way back and try to find it. But usually, if you have a voltage drop from your alternator, it's gonna be on the positive side. Now, let's try to apply what we've learned so far into all the other things I talked about early on in the video. So first, let's do how, let's show you how voltage drop test can be used to try to find a parasitic draw using the fuses inside your junction box. All right, so having an electrical parasitic draw on your car's battery is basically a component inside your engine or inside your cabin working and being on and drawing current when it's not supposed to. Now, one of the ways you can do this is through the fuses inside your junction box or inside the, the cabin uh, fuse box. Basically, you do a voltage drop test across the different fuses looking for voltage drop. Now, as far as how you can do that, well, like the name suggests, it's a fuse. It must have its own fixed amount of resistance because it needs to blow when a certain amount of current or amps goes through it in order to protect the circuit. Now, it having its own resistance, it basically means it's gonna have its own share of the voltage drop as voltage is going through that circuit and powering on, let's say your blower motor, that's what you suspect ha having is that it's being on when it's not supposed to and having that parasitic draw. So, Let's say in this setup, let's say that's the fuse and that's the blower motor and current is going through it, it's on and you know, so you measure basically at the fuse, you put one test lead on one end of the fuse, the other test lead at the other end, in this case it's going to be here, you get that voltage drop and that's going to be proportionate to that fuse and you're going to have a voltage drop if you have a parasitic drop, which, is, which basically means that blower is on when it's not supposed to and you have current flowing, so if you have a voltage drop at that test light when you're not supposed to. That means you found your parasitic draw. So yeah, you're basically testing for voltage drop across these two points because this fuse inside here, that piece has its own fixed amount of resistance. Now, of course, every fuse inside your junction box has its own fixed amount of resistance depending on its amp rating. And of course, the voltage drop is gonna vary based on that. And some voltage drop may be even ac acceptable depending on which fuse or what component you're testing for using a voltage drop test to test for a parasitic draw. But this video is not about doing this test, uh, this parasitic draw using a voltage drop. Just simply try to make you understand the concept of how it works. All right, next let's explain how voltage drop relates to and why. So when sometimes you're checking out wiring diagrams, you see a, a resistor inside your powertrain control module or other electronic control modules for your car. Now this one took me a while to figure out and I was able to figure it out as to why there's a resistor inside your powertrain control module when I figured out how two loads in the same circuit changes the voltage drop across the first load inside the circuit. So a lot of times when you're looking at wiring diagrams, you're gonna see a, a resistor, sign of a resistor inside your powertrain control module or a different module. And then from there you see your, and that's in, in front of the five volt reference voltage, let's say to an intake air temperature sensor. So five volts comes from your PCM, goes through that resistor, then to the sensor, then you have a sensor ground back at the PCM. This is gonna be a basic two wire intake air temperature sensor. Basically, when you have a resistor, that's one load. The temperature sensor itself is one load, so you have two loads on the system. Now, when you have two loads on the system, like we talked about or I showed you, the voltage drop across each load is directly proportionate to the amount of the resistance of said load in relation to the total amount of resistance inside the circuit. So again, for the sake of argument, Let's say this uh, potentiometer for our fuel level sensor is our inlet air temperature sensor in this equation. Now the inlet air temperature sensor, the resistance of that sensor changes as the temperature of the air changes. And it's the same thing. So right now I have the test leads hooked up to positive side of the battery. And then this one after this potentiometer, pretty much like the air inlet air temperature sensor, as this resistance changes, the voltage the voltage drop also changes on this, uh, on this multimeter as you can see as well. So basically, if you don't have this resistor here, there won't be varying voltage here. Since you only have one load, the voltage drop will equal the amount of voltage supplied. And the only way would be to measure amps or current that's, going, that's flowing through this circuit. And I'm gonna be assuming that measuring amps or designing a PCM that measures amps in this circuit is gonna be more expensive than simply measuring voltage. That's why they do it this way. I'm not an electrical engineer 
for uh, you know, electrical circuits, but that's just an assumption. That's why they probably put these resistors here. So you have two loads. So this, this line will be have varying uh, voltage. They measure that and then they fine tune everything from there. Also having this setup allows you to have just, uh, you know, sensors with just two wires. Now, there are some sensors that have the, the reference, the five volt reference uh, wire. They'll have the ground and a sensor signal wire. Uh, but I'm going to assume those sensors, it's going to depend on the sensor, the type of the sensor. Also, if it's a sensor that's going to be uh, you know, involved in calibrating the engine with the air fuel mixture or a sensor like this, it's just the fuel level sensor. It doesn't have to be super, super precise. Uh, so that's why these could have two wires. But also you could have a sensor with just one wire, with just the 5 volt reference voltage, and then it can be grounded through the, the engine itself since the engine itself was grounded. But, you know, those are pretty rare. Generally, you'll have, you know, two, two wire sensors one uh, 5 volt reference voltage and then the ground wire as well. All right, so what else did I promise to explain? Oh yeah, so if you're back probing a connector and you expect to see 5 volts and you see 5 volts with the connector plugged, but then you, when you unplug that connector with the back probe still in there, you see 12 volts, here's why. All right, so my understanding is when that happens is that the manufacturer has not put a 5 volt regulator for that sensor or set of sensors. Now most sensors work on 5 volts, but you know, the way to get around putting a 5 volt reg voltage regulator here is that, you know, you put battery voltage here, then you run it through, a, you put the right resistor there instead for this wire, and then that way, the, the voltage drop, the way it would work out is that 5 volts would get to the, to the whatever sensor, let's say it's intake air temperature sensor. So when you plug it in and you measure the, you back probe this to the ground, you get the 5 volts that's supposed to be here, but it's when it's unplugged, you basically you know, just measuring by your test leads, you're measuring the 12 volts that's available here, the potential difference in that circuit. Since current is not flowing, the circuit is not complete, you get 12 volts right here with this unplugged when you put it, the other test lead to the ground. Boy, this video got long. <laughs> it probably should have been four different videos, but hey, if you made it this far and everything has made sense to you to this point, congratulations. You know, doing electrical diagnosis, specifically voltage drop testing, should be a lot easier for you now. Now, if you're a brave soul, I dare you. Ask me more questions in the comment section down below. But until the next video, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, hit that bell notification, and also check out these videos. I'll put links to one in this corner, one below it. Also, more videos in the system box. You can click and watch those as well. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.